and welcome to another episode of the Mini Battle C series by Athens on the Course. My name is Manos Brilakis and I'm the head of the organizing committee of this course. Being driven by our passion for continuous education, development and communication with our international friends, we came up with the idea of launching monthly webinars dedicated to soldier pathology and treatment, the Mini Battles E-Series. Counting down to the next Athens on the Course, we hope to welcome you and host you again in person live in Athens next May. Today, uh, it's uh, one year after the first episode of this uh, series, and I uh, used to be with Manos Andoganakis. Today, I'm alone because he is traveling, he's, he has a delay in the change in the plane, and now uh, he's uh, in the plane, so he cannot be with us uh, today. Every month, two charismatic orthopedic surgeons from all around the world join us and debate on their different approaches. To a specific issue. We also have two, uh, two more uh, guests uh, to discuss with them the, the subject uh, discussed. But, but before introducing our guest, please take a moment to vote our, for our first question, which is Do you consider performing a shoulder arthroplasty as an outpatient surgery? The answer is yes, the option is yes or no, and please take your time and answer. So today is the episode 7, uh, it is dedicated to the outpatient to total shoulder arthroplasty, and with us, with us we uh, have two exquisite surgeons and friends. From one side, Dr. Peter Vesiridis, orthopedic surgeon from Boston, Massachusetts, from USA, who will share with us the current trends of outpatient total shoulder arthroplasty. And uh, on the other hand, we, we have invited Professor Dr. Edward McFarland from the John Hoskins University of USA, who, uh, but however, some technical problems with, uh, with, with uh, his hospital firewall don't allow us to, to connect with him with our specific software used for this um, uh, we used this episode. I'm very sure about this. However, it's a technical problem. It, it, we cannot, we could not uh, uh, predict it. However, with us we have also Professor Dr. John Ferusis, Senior Consultant Head of Orthopedic Department of Shoulder Service of Asclepio Bulas Hospital in Athens, Greece, and Dr. Irene Sari, anesthesiologist from Aegea Hospital in Athens, Greece, who will be sharing with us their experience on outpatient total shoulder arthroplasty. Welcome you all. This is the evaluation. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So, uh, for the participants throughout the battle, you can also submit your questions. So, without further delay, let this mini battle begin. Peter, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Perlakis, for the uh, introduction. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, also, thank you, Dr. Antonio Yanakis. I know he's not here, but you guys have done a wonderful job with the Athens Shoulder Course, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the uh, I'd like to present on relative complications and trends of outpatient total shoulder arthroplasty today. Uh, I have no relevant conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Uh, Dr. McFarland and colleagues recently published this, this study in uh, JSCS this year, 2021, demonstrating a very clear increasing incidence of primary and reverse anatomic shoulder arthroplasty in the United States. You can see between 2012 and 2017, uh, both anatomic and reverse uh, shoulder arthroplasty has increased in incidence, whereas hemiarthroplasty has decreased over that same period of time. And then you can see at in 2014, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty began to outpace anatomic shoulder arthroplasty in terms of incidence. And I think that we'll continue to see this trend uh, in the upwards direction. In terms of a transition to outpatient shoulder arthroplasty, 
Uh, our total knee and total hip colleagues really have been the pioneers in this regard, likely due to their volume. Um, but we are not far behind in this regard. Um, you can see that the case series were published earlier in the total knee and total hip arthroplasty, but again, we're catching up. Between 2006 and 2017, here are just a few of the uh, papers that have been published uh, with regards to total knee and total hip arthroplasty. The first uh, case series of total shoulder arthroplasty performed on an outpatient basis was, was uh, published actually in the anesthesia literature in 2005. Uh, these authors used an interscaling perineural ropivacaine infusion uh, for pain control. And in the first phase of this uh, feasibility study, they looked at eight patients. They found that five out of these eight patients met discharge, discharge criteria for discharge home while in the recovery room. They didn't actually discharge any of them due to insurance considerations, but again, uh, the majority met the discharge criteria. Uh, in the second phase of this study, six patients uh, were examined, and they found that all six patients met discharge criteria in the recovery room, and five were successfully discharged home on the same day. In all patients, postoperative pain was well controlled. Uh, the opioid requirement and sleep disturbances were minimal, and function and patient satisfaction uh, was high. Um, the first uh, case series in the orthopedic literature was in 2000. Eight, um, and this was basically a cohort of eight patients performed on an out, eight surgeries performed on outpatient basis, and eight patients performed uh, with an overnight hospital stay. Continuous brachial plexus nerve block was used in all of them, and uh, this study found no readmissions. The nerve block worked on average of six days. The pain uh, score was on average one out of ten postoperatively, and only one patient actually actually required oral analgesics while using the uh, nerve block. All patients were very satisfied and would have the surgery again. So starting off on a good foot here. Um, the first study comparing outpatient versus inpatient arthroplasty, um, looking at a larger cohort, was published in 2016. Um, these uh, authors looked at a retrospective cohort between 2005 and 2014 and used the powerful American College of Surgeons NISQIP database, uh, where you can search for specific diagnoses as well as complications, adverse events, readmissions, and whatnot. Uh, so they looked at 7,000 patients with the vast majority, 97%, um, undergoing inpatient shoulder arthroplasty. Looking at the 30-day adverse event rate, this was 2.3% in the outpatient arthroplasty group and 7.8% in the inpatient arthroplasty group. So uh, that was significant. Uh, now, looking at the 30-day readmission rate, there was 1.7% outpatient readmission uh, or a readmission from an outpatient arthroplasty and a 2.9% readmission after inpatient shoulder arthroplasty. So very, very similar in that regard. Um, where the adverse event, adverse event rate was uh, different with bivariate logistic regression, when the authors looked at a multivariate logistic regression, the odds of an adverse or event or readmission were actually not statistically significant. So basically, they have demonstrated that the two uh, groups were comparable in both adverse event rate and readmission rate. Uh, this well-done study in, in 2006 uh, won the NEAR Award, uh, and it was published in JSES 2017. Um, and there were 30 patients in each cohort. It was a matched cohort study, 30 patients who underwent outpatient shoulder arthroplasty at an ambulatory surgery center, and then 30 patients who out, uh, underwent outpatient shoulder arthroplasty in a hospital setting. Um, since they matched the cohort, there was no significant difference regarding age, pre-op ASA score, the indications for surgery, or BMI. And there were actually no reoperations or readmissions within 90 days in either group. Looking at complications, uh, in the ambulatory surgery center group or the outpatient group, there were four total complications. Uh, there was uh, arthrofibrosis in two patients, 
one mild asymptomatic anterior subluxation. And there was one major complication, which was the subscapularis failure uh, when the patient fell 11 weeks postoperatively. And then looking at the complication rate in the hospital cohort, there were three total complications, uh, one mild asymptomatic um, anterior subluxation, one superficial venous thrombosis, and one patient who uh, required a blood transfusion. So overall, similar complication rate of 13% in the outpatient cohort versus 10% in the hospital cohort. Um, my colleagues and I uh, performed this study looking at uh, it was a database study uh, using the Pearl Diver database, which is based on insurance claims here in the United States. Uh, we looked at the years 2007 to 2016. Um, there were uh, 1,500 outpatient shoulder arthroplasties compared to essentially 16,000 inpatient shoulder arthroplasties. Not surprisingly, the incidence of both outpatient and inpatient shoulder arthroplasty increased during the study period. And then also, interestingly, the age distribution was similar for both outpatient and inpatient uh, throughout all age ranges, as you can see in the, in the chart here. This is a very busy table, but I, I just want to highlight a couple of things here. Um, there are similar rates of surgical complications with regards to revision, dislocation, and periprosthetic fracture. There are also similar uh, rates of medical complication, which you can see on the bottom half of the chart here. Uh, those include postoperative cardiac, pulmonary, and renal complications. Interestingly, there was a significantly lower rate of stiffness requiring manipulation under anesthesia at the six-month and one-year time point uh, favoring the outpatient uh, cohort. Uh, there was a 1% incidence in the outpatient cohort uh, versus a 2.3% incidence in the inpatient cohort. And also, also interestingly, there was a slightly increased rate of postoperative surgical site infection in the outpatient cohort of 0.9% versus 0.65% in the inpatient cohort. This is only an absolute risk increase of 0.25%. And further studies uh, subsequent to this have really not borne out any increased rate, rate of postoperative surgical site infection. Um, so in the past four to five years, there have been a significant increase in the amount of data uh, looking at outpatient shoulder arthroplasty in our literature, uh, which has brought about systematic reviews. This systematic review published this year in International Orthopedics looked at 10 level three retrospective studies. Um, they combined to look at 7,000 outpatient shoulder arthroplasties and 192,000 inpatient shoulder arthroplasties. As expected, outpatient shoulder arthroplasty had relatively younger and healthier patients, and they also found that there was no difference in 30 and 90-day readmissions for either group. They found significantly fewer surgical complications in the outpatient arthroplasty cohort, but when they looked at a subgroup analysis, there were no significant differences in all complications if the studies had matched cohorts. Revision rates were similar at both 12 and 24 months, and the two studies that looked at cost savings found a significant cost reduction uh, favoring outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, this well done systematic review in JBJS reviews was published last year, and it looks at 20 studies. You can see the list of those studies here, all published between 2016 and 2020, all level of evidence three or four, retrospective cohort studies, retrospective case studies, and case series. Um, this uh, nicely, this diagram, this pie chart nicely demonstrates in green, there were six studies that found no difference in complications uh, comparing inpatient and outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. The yellow demonstrates studies that found actually a lower complication rate in the outpatient shoulder arthroplasty cohort compared with the inpatient cohort. And there were actually no studies which demonstrated a higher complication rate with the outpatient group. So if anything, a lower complication rate or equivalent complication rate with outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. These, uh, these authors uh, in this systematic review also did a pooled analysis uh, looking at 30 and 90 day readmission rate. And you can see for the 30 day readmission rate on the left, uh, it uh, favored outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. There was a lower uh, readmission rate for outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. And also on the right-hand side, you can see 90-day readmission rate 
favors outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. Um, of the studies in this systematic review that looked at cost effectiveness, all found uh, outpatient total shoulder arthroplasty to be significantly less costly than inpatient, sometimes by a little, sometimes by a lot, as you can see in this uh, graph. They also found that, again, unsurprisingly, outpatient uh, shoulder arthroplasty uh, patients are likely to be healthier and patient selection is the most critical factor for determining the success of outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. The barriers both perceived and actual include social support system, patient age, medical comorbidities, and concern for medical complications. Uh, this study uh, published in 2019 in J JSES um, looked at 61 patients, all of whom underwent outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. There were no cardiopulmonary events re that required intervention or admission. There were a small number of um, complications as listed um, below. Um, and from this study, the authors have uh, created a, a nice algorithm, which you see here. And I'll just uh, briefly highlight uh, this pathway. So, you know, looking first at age, age less than or equal to, to 70, um, and a, a thorough pre-anesthetic evaluation will determine if uh, preoperative hematocrit of greater than 30, no significant cardiac comorbidities, and um, no significant pulmonary comorbidities as well and no history of DVT or pulmonary embolism. If all those uh, criteria are met, uh, you have a very good chance of having an, a successful outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. So um, this is a, a helpful um, predictive algorithm to help uh, select who may be a good candidate for shoulder arthroplasty on an outpatient basis. Uh, this is uh, a study which highlighted their particular outpatient pathway is, of course, very important to create your own uh, pathway. Um, but based upon the, the data that we have, this is a good pathway to start off with. Now, uh, these authors did not use a regional block, as you can see on the left hand side here. Um, that was their own choosing. But um, I, many folks would go with a regional block uh, for uh, intraoperative and postoperative anesthesia. It's also important to consider antiemetics uh, and multimodal anesthesia. Um, it's also important to make sure that you've educated patients uh, very well, as well as their family, um, and then have uh, physical therapy um, in place, uh, both as a consult in the PACU and the postoperative recovery uh, unit, as well as as a post, as an outpatient. So uh, the keys for success that we've found so far include uh, thorough education of patients and staff members preoperatively, uh, utilizing multimodal pain management, including regional anesthesia, cryotherapy, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, and then only if needed opioids. Gabapentin can be considered, it may be a useful adjunct, and then also an antiemetic such as Zofran uh, can be uh, very helpful as well. In terms of patient selection, less than uh, age 65 or 70, independent uh, patients with good social support and med minimal medical comorbidities would be the ideal candidates. And also it's important to know uh, what pathology um, you are attempting to treat as an outpatient. Uh, we should really shy away from revisions um, in particular at this point, but primary uh, glenohumeral joint arthritis, rotator cuff arthropathy, and fractures are all, all good um, candidates uh, for outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. So in conclusion, there's an increasing incidence of outpatient shoulder arthroplasty, and it can be performed safely based upon uh, the data that we have thus far in the literature. Uh, patient selection is paramount and preoperative education of both the patient and family, as well as your staff members is essential uh, to setting yourself up and everyone for success. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Brilakis and, and Antonio Yanakis, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the fifth Athens shoulder course in May, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this interesting presentation. My pleasure. 
And uh, the good news is that uh, Dr. McFarland is with us. But before uh, moving on his lecture, uh, please have a look at our second poll question. Which are the barriers for making the transition from shoulder arthroplasty to an out outpatient surgery? The options are the patient's comorbidities, the available support system, the concerns for medical complications, some of the above, or all of the above. So please take your time and answer uh, the poll question. Oh, great. Dr. McFarland, happy to see you with us. <laughs> okay. I am uh, my IT specialist. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, IT specialist, for uh, for achieving this. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you have my talk. Yes, you you are just in time. This is this is uh, your turn, and uh, I think you have sent your talk pre-recorded. Yes. So, please, uh, can you show us the lecture of Dr. McFarland? <laughs> Thanks yeah, very much go. for the opportunity to be involved in this uh, debate, and I'm looking forward to a uh, good, uh, thorough discussion and uh, the challenges uh, sure. thereof. I'd like to recognize my co-conspirators who uh, helped us out with this uh, presentation and uh, the talk. <clears throat> I don't have any uh, disclosures. I would like to welcome everybody who's listening to uh, uh, us from Baltimore. And uh, it's a bright, sunny day out here right now, and it's uh, very pleasant. So these are the reasons I will never do outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. I think uh, my major concern with the whole thing is it's not really about the patient, it's about the money. And uh, I think that probably we wouldn't be having this conversation if there wasn't pressure from the insurance companies and maybe even the government. The other thing, too, is uh, I think the comorbidity restrictions leave very few patients eligible, particularly in my practice, where <clears throat> the average patient, uh, you know, has a liver transplant or something. Also, the literature on this subject is really pretty skewed. If you look at uh, all the reported data, it's all level three to five. There's really no ASC data available as um, it's not really routinely collected by any regulatory agency. Last thing is any complication I think is a bad complication. I think if someone has a complication, it's gonna always be worse at home. And if one patient were to ever die after an operation that I did an ASC at home for some complication or another, I probably would not forgive myself. And, uh, and sort of in tandem to that, neither would the lawyers for that patient, especially in the United States. Also, I think setting up a system is pretty much an administrative nightmare uh, and uh, going through all the committees and going through all the stuff. I think you have to have a lot of support to get that done. Patients with complications also will go to the nearest hospital, which means that I can't even see them except as a guest. Uh, but then that's against, uh, against the law because you can't practice medicine in hospitals that you're not privileged. Uh, and then um, there are really no benefits to the physicians. I think if you uh, look at what outpatient surgery does for us, it makes it maybe so that we don't have to do rounds and we can make money if we own the surgery center. So uh, I think that there's all sorts of reasons and I'll go through some of these in more detail. Let's talk about the money. Basically, there's no doubt that outpatient uh, total shoulders are less costly than uh, ones done in the hospital. There's a 40% reduction if it's done uh, outpatient and inpatient. And the reimbursement uh, for 30 days after surgery is really about the same, regardless of whether it's outpatient or inpatient. So I think the money is definitely better uh, in terms of um, uh, the payers. The, 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 cost, the cost does depend on location. There's study study by these guys in JSS International and found that uh, actually uh, in-hospital costs and outpatient hospital costs are actually quite similar, uh, whereas the biggest cost savings are in the ambulatory surgical arena, as uh, stated by uh, our esteemed colleague. Um, this is uh, also uh, difficult, the selection criteria for patients. 
This is the flow chart done by uh, Dr. Thogmorton, who's really done a lot of the uh, great work on this. But who does the screening? Uh, who knows what's a bad complicate, uh, uh, bad uh, predisposing condition, and who doesn't? Uh, the populations will also differ significantly from inpatient to outpatient in terms of their comorbidities. So the contraindications to outpatient uh, is suggested uh, by these authors is any patient over 70 years of age who has hypertension, pacemakers, anemia, obesity, chronic heart or lung disease, or pulmonary disease. And this really knocks out a huge percentage of my population. Uh, at Hopkins, it goes even further. You know, there's no, you almost can't have a cardiac condition. Uh, we see a fair number of sickle cell patients. We have lots of transplant patients people with difficult airways, anybody that's an ASA three or so can't be done at our ASC. So the really percentage of my population that could be done as an ASC for a shoulder replacement is very narrow. So the contraindications for doing it again, depend on your practice. Uh, again, less than 10% of my practice would qualify, but this is actually the opinion of Brolin, who uh, also suggested that you need a certain number of TSAs to be competent and to have a proper staff that knows how to do the procedure. But at our ASC, I'm still getting rotating uh, for just uh, arth for just uh, cuffs and things like that. Dr. Rafaland, can you unmute, please? I'm on unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, of course. Where'd my slides go? <laughs> I have an IT expert, but he just got fired. <laughs> the planets are not uh, in proper position for today's uh, uh, webinar. However, we will win uh, all the bad luck. Can you share your uh, presentation? Uh, you want me to start it now? Uh, you can share it and start from uh, the slide that do what do whatever you want. Well, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure where to go. So, uh, so if I pull up the slides, let me let me just pull up the slides, okay. and uh, we can figure it out. Yeah, I mean, uh, next thing. There's a small button in the bottom allows you to share. All right, so here's my talk. And do you see the slides? Not yet. I'm waiting for this. All right, so... Let me see, hold on. Where is it? On the uh, lower right? In the lower, in the middle, there's a, an option share. Are you talking about on? Can you put him on speaker? Oh, oh there. Okay, here we go. Video file. Share the video file. Okay, hold on. PowerPoint, right? Can you see it? Yes, can you see it? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, you can carry. So, so you can, so you can, can see you it now? Can you see the PP, uh, PowerPoint yes. now? We can see it properly. Now, is this the one, um, is this the one with sound or um, I have to talk myself? You have to talk. You have to talk to I understand. All right. Well, it's going to be kind of repetitive, but I'll do whatever you want. I can start where we were, but I'm not sure where that was exactly. Go as you like, Dr. Marfaland. 
Well, uh, I tell you what, I'll just I'll start over and go fast. <laughs> Anyway, I apologize uh, for uh, the, the errors. I'm obviously not a IT kind of guy, but uh, fortunately, somebody figured it out. Uh, it is a great day here in Baltimore. These are the reasons that I don't think I'll ever do outpatient shoulder arthroplasty. I think probably one of the things for me is, uh, you know, uh, somebody came up with the idea to save some money, and uh, then we're trying to fit a system around it. And I think uh, this is really not about the patient and patient safety. It's really about the money. Uh, obviously, that's important, uh, but I think it particularly uh, every so every hospital system or social system is different, and uh, we have certain uh, challenges here in terms of cost. Anyway, the comorbidity restrictions I think in my practice don't leave many patients. Uh, the literature on this is fairly skewed; it's all level three to five. Most of the studies are national databases. There's really no data on ASCs or uh, uh, outpatient uh, surgical centers. Uh, any complications a bad one, uh, I think, and it's particularly going to be worse at home for any patient. Uh, interesting enough, uh, if a patient were to die outpatient, uh, number one, I wouldn't forgive myself, but then neither would the lawyers, particularly in the states. And uh, with the system as it's set up right now, uh, some of those uh, potential deaths could go unreported. Uh, also, I think setting up a system is an administrative nightmare. Uh, young guys like Peter probably can tolerate it, but uh, it's really kind of painful. Uh, patients with complications also in the States, if they have a complication, they're obligated to take them to the nearest hospital, which means that um, we can't talk with them and we it's against the law, basically. And um, I don't really see any benefits to the surgeons to doing this, except you don't do any rounds. But if you own a surgery center, then there's certainly uh, significant advantages because you make money. So uh, there's no doubt that uh, outpatient total shoulder arthroplasty is less costly. Uh, the 30-day uh, reimbursement after surgery is still lower uh, for uh, outpatient. Uh, however, if you look at uh, costs in the inpatient uh, and outpatient hospital, uh, if you do that as an outpatient in a hospital setting, the uh, charges are really not that uh, different. But if you do it in an ambulatory surgical center, then uh, the charges are fairly significantly different. So you have to think about whether you're talking about apples and oranges. Uh, he mentioned uh, Thogmorton's uh, uh, algorithm like this. I personally find things like this drive me crazy. Uh, I think it's uh, very broad and restrictive, but you have to ask yourself who's going to be doing this screening using this algorithm. It's going to be, I, I, I doubt Dr. Th Thogmorton does it himself, but I also think that this algorithm is different for a patient that's going to be done as an outpatient center or a patient is going to be done outpatient in a hospital. So I think those are variables that are really important. Uh, the contraindications for surgery uh, are also a little bit uh, controversial, uh, but as uh, Peter mentioned, the recommendation from these guys was that anybody over 70, hypertension, pacemakers, anemia, obesity, of which we have plenty in the United States, chronic heart or lung disease, or previous DVTs. In my place, though, probably I see, because we see a lot of sick patients, I get a lot of sick patients. And any, in our AFC, you can't do anybody who's an insulin-dependent diabetic. You can't do anybody who has sickle cell disease or has atrial fib. But we have all sorts of transplant patients can't be done there. Uh, anybody with a difficult airway can't be done there. And uh, also pretty much anybody that's an ASA3 or uh, anesthesia scoring system can't be done. So already we're limited as to the number of patients we could ever do. And probably less than 10% of my practice would qualify. I would say it's probably more than that. It's probably 5%. The other question is, how many total shoulders do you have to do to be able to do it uh, at an ASC? If you're doing only 10 a year, uh, then doing it uh, as an outpatient is going to be a nightmare, uh, primarily because you need the staff that know what they're doing and uh, you need to have all the equipment, et cetera. So in terms of patient comfort and uh, pain relief and whether they actually think that's a good idea or not, uh, below in the group, uh, they looked at 36 eligible patients out of how many know, how many you think they have, probably thousands, and uh, half refused uh, same-day discharge and uh, another 8% uh, had to stay overnight anyway. So again, there's uh, you know, there's a deal of what are you going to do with the patients who don't want to do it, and uh, despite the insurance saying otherwise, it turn, creates quite a dilemma. In terms of patient satisfaction, patients seem to be pretty satisfied with uh, outpatient uh, uh, type uh, surgeries or uh, arthroplasties, but 
Um, if you look at these studies, the numbers are really pretty low. So whether this is going to um, uh, be applied to a broader group is very difficult to say. Uh, the other thing, too, is if you look at the literature on this uh, subject, all are level three or above, as mentioned earlier. The uh, patient populations are absolutely different uh, in terms of who's going to be done outpatient than inpatient. So it's not oftentimes a apt uh, comparison. And uh, this meta-analysis suggested that there's a high risk of bias in the uh, reported literature and that uh, we really probably should uh, restrain making any conclusions until there's better studies. So, you know, I think it's easy to say that the studies uh, support it, but really the literature is a little bit suspect. The other thing that's a real problem is readmissions. Uh, our group uh, looked at uh, readmissions uh, using a, a database and found that uh, the outpatient readmission rate was higher than that for inpatients. And uh, that creates quite a dilemma for not only the patients, but the doctors and everybody else. Um, uh, this study also uh, did a meta-analysis of level three studies and found that readmission rates were fairly the same, but where's the patient gonna go? You know, I think it's very difficult to have a patient with a severe complication or potentially severe complication going to a hospital two hours away or five hours away or even down the street. Uh, these guys also looked at infection rate. The infection rate, uh, oddly enough, is higher for uh, outpatient than inpatient, and it was statistically significant. Uh, the other thing that's a little bit concerning, as I mentioned this earlier, is the ASCs in the United States are not required to report uh, downstream uh, complications. So this is an article in the lay press uh, in the USA Today, and they exposed uh, uh, 260 patients who had died uh, as out, after outpatient surgery that were never reported. And admittedly, that's kind of maybe some uh, yellow journalism, but the fact of the matter remains that somebody can be done at an ASC and go home and die, and it wouldn't show up in the statistics at all. So I think uh, there needs to be some uh, reckoning of uh, what, what results really occur for patients who are going outpatient. The other thing, too, is uh, the morbidity uh, and particularly the mortality is similar to two groups. But again, if somebody dies on the out, as an outpatient, uh, if it, particularly an ASC, you don't really know. And the other is, too, is if you're taking care of a patient who should die in the United States, you better brace yourself for a serious uh, litigation battle. So uh, the last thing is the administrative nightmare. I think the physician has to be involved in every part of the planning. Uh, for us to start something here, there'd be so many committees that you'd have to go through. And so and every country is probably different. But, you know, sitting in on uh, these uh, committees trying to convince people of this or that is absolutely mind boggling. Uh, there also needs to be a system to deal with complications the night of surgery. Who's going to see the patient next day if there's a problem? Uh, Throckmorton also uh, gave some uh things that were criteria, things that needed to be done or should be part of the system. One is a, a post-op anesthesia care unit. Um, at our ASC, they try to get everybody out within an hour. There has to be a staff person to call the next day. There also should be a hotline for patients to contact at night or on a, uh, after hours or on weekends. So who's going to take that call? Uh, is it going to be a second year resident? Is it going to be a PA? Uh, you know, you got to have all that stuff lined up. Um, so again, we mentioned patients live far away. Do you have to do something with local hotels for people? Who's gonna see the patient if there's a problem? Who answers the phone calls? I think to make it work, you have to have a sufficient amount of equipment. You have to have skilled or nurses and technicians. You have, uh, they recommend having a nurse navigator and patient educators. These, all, these are all things that have to be organized and don't come cheap. There has to be a 24 hour response, phone responsiveness, uh, which we have at our institution, but who knows who you're gonna get. There also need to be financial incentives for the staffs, the anesthesia, and the surgeons. Uh, that's probably only if you have an ASC. I think if you're in a hospital situation, a lot of that money is not going to come downstream to you, uh, but it might help uh, the hospital. And lastly, you have to have really great teamwork, and everybody has to be on the same page. So uh, the insurance companies in the states are already sort of making things terrible for us. Uh, they try to demand or tell us which patients can be done inpatient and need to be done as an outpatient. Uh, I think this is absolutely astonishing because there's really no, nowhere has it been said that doing patients as an outpatient is the standard of care. But yet the insurance companies are 
are pummeling us about this. And for them, it's not about patient safety. Uh, it's really about the money. And uh, that's really kind of gets me in the crawl because, you know, uh, my patients, I want to do the very best thing for my patients. And right now doing them as an outpatient is not it. So in the end, is it worth it? Uh, all these uh, things that I've mentioned here, who's going to take care of the patient later? Who's going to do the phone calls? What if they end up in somebody else's ER? Uh, and for me right now, and probably for the near future, the answer is no. I don't think it's designed really for the patient in mind. I think it's about cost and it's about money. And that always kind of makes me a little bit nervous. I think also the facility has to have buy-in or institutional buy-in. They have to give you support to do these kinds of things. Uh, if I'm left to set this all up on my own, it's just not going to happen. So I think in the final analysis, in the long run, it's not really worth it unless you're in a facility that has all these things pointing in the same direction. And um, I personally am not going to be doing it anytime soon. So that's my story and I'm sticking with it. So thanks so much. Can you hear me? For your thorough insights. Before this lecture, we have the answer to vote. Now we can see the results. In the first question, if you uh, if you consider uh, if you consider to uh, to to perform a shoulder or blasty, uh, 67 percent said yes, and 33 percent said no. So Peter, you start with uh, an advantage in our uh, in our participants, and in the second question, the uh, all the proposed group. Uh, options, the comorbidities, the available support system, the medical complication was the main concern. Uh, all, all the available was the concerns in the participants to participate, to move from the uh, inpatient to outpatient surgery. So, uh, Dr. Ferrucis, what do you consider? Do you perform, uh, do you consider to perform a shoulderoplasty as an outpatient surgery? There is no doubt that some of my patients could leave the same day from the hospital. The question is, who is going to uh, decide? Uh, I mean, what's the patient selection is uh, very important for this case. Uh, I want to point it out something that has to do from for the uh, has to do uh, from the definition of what we mean outpatient. In many patients, in many papers, outpatient means the same day. There are other papers suggest uh, saying that the outpatient is anything below 24 hours. That means that include uh, the first post-operative night, which is, in my view, it's very important to have the patient in the hospital during the first post-operative night. Uh, Generally speaking, I would say that about 10%, if more, of my patients could leave the hospital the next day, not the same day. Uh, next day, in about 30 hours, most of them are ready to leave. But we have first to uh, make an algorithm to see what's the uh, definite, what the, uh, the the prerequisites are. Uh, there are so many things that it's difficult to, 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 to have a clear view which patient you're going to uh, let in to uh, discharge the first day. But there is no doubt that there are some of them can leave. Yes, yes. We have with us uh, Dr. Sari, which is an anesthesiologist. <laughs> I'm in a battle. I'm in a battle because I'm in the middle of a hemorrhage, oh. a prostate uh, bleeding. Okay. We are stable now, so I can be with you. That's perfect. So is it an out? Is it an outpatient? <laughs> uh, no, no. He was uh, inside the hospital. He got operated this afternoon, but he has got uh, bleeding problems. 
blood problems and hopefully he was not discharged coagulation so... no he was not discharged <laughs> <laughs> yes so... we should discharge some people after having a shoulder arthroplasty but it's uh, we have to think it very well twice <laughs> maybe because it's very important to to look at the comorbidities if we have got a patient that's 50 years old and had a shoulder arthroplasty and doesn't have any other problems health problems maybe it would be a good patient to be an outpatient uh if we have got a 75 year old man with heart problems lung problems under anticoagulation uh, drugs i don't think it's a good idea to discharge him yet we keep here in the year mm -hmm. hospital with dr donagenakis we keep about uh, 30 hours most of them are ready to go uh in 24 hours but we don't uh we're thinking about starting now a new uh, 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 try to have a new. Uh, no, forget. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, sir, you, you, uh, yes, a follow up of patients that uh, are going to be half of them are going to be discharged uh, as a one day patients, and uh, half of them are going to stay inside. It, it's going to be mostly anesthetic. Uh, but uh, we're going to use the Oxford shoulder score, which uh, I understand is very important for orthopedic surgeons. And we're going to see. About a year from now, I think we're going to be ready. It's just starting. Irini, uh, yes? the, 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 the usual opioids is the main yes. concern for you for you for discharging the patients the same day and uh, if so could we, it is possible to do the shoulder arthroplasty an opioid free procedure we don't like opioid free uh, procedures here okay. we don't uh, even use uh, intraskeletal uh, blockage of the nerves because of all the the things that could happen during having them uh, we use uh, opioids and non-opioids in uh, per, uh, patients uh, with arthroscopy that went under arthroscopy and arthroplasty. Uh, I think um, it would be possible for us to monitor them at home. Yet, uh, we have to consider that they must not have mobility problems, other mobility problems besides their shoulder, and that we... Uh, that the patients should not be alone at home. There should be a nurse with them, someone that uh, is familiar with uh, medicine, with nursing. But I think opioids are not bad. Many people think that they are bad. It's not bad for all people. There are people that cannot uh, have morphine or tramadol, but uh, there are people that fits them well. We like those medicines as an anesthetist. <laughs> we also like it because <laughs> you have to know how to use them. Okay, yes, it's very important. So, uh, Peter, uh, the the reason for uh, having this title in this in this episode was that uh, I read somewhere that uh, in, in near future. Uh, outpatient facilities and department will uh, will will host 100 percent of the orthopedic problems and uh, uh, this i don't know if in the us uh, this is a trend and i understand that uh, uh, insurance companies uh, uh, pre pressure about for this uh, direction uh, how you comment on this how do you believe on this well, I, I think it's definitely a, a trend. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to 100% because, uh, you know, as as Dr. McFarland's uh, patient population uh, exemplifies, really there are a lot of people who need to be admitted after orthopedic procedures. Um, so I, we, we are seeing, at least in the United States, we are seeing a pretty significant trend towards outpatient procedures in general. And then also we are seeing it in, in shoulder arthroplasty, um, you know, and it is, 
Yeah, it's, it is a shame. I would agree with Dr. McFarland that it seems like the main driver is financial by insurance companies. So I, I don't think that we should, uh, you know, kind of submit to that pressure and allow them to be the drivers. I think it also, though, depends upon your exact patient population. Um, you know, for instance, uh, currently in, in present times, in COVID times, a lot of patients don't want to be admitted to the hospital. Um, and we also, in my particular hospital, we're having issues as far as operating room availability, anesthesia availability. Uh, and frankly, it, it's much more difficult to book an inpatient procedure than an outpatient procedure. Um, one of my one of my colleagues ha had all of his uh, total knee and total hip arthroplasties canceled that he was planning to do today because of bed availability at our hospital. Um, you know, not that arthroplasty is an emergent procedure, but you know, patients do want to get on with life at some point. Um, so those are a couple of my thoughts. I I also agree with Dr. McFarland that. Uh, Better data is certainly needed. We only have level three and level four studies here. We need to see some um, higher higher level studies, uh, non-biased non studies, and uh, I think that that will help us. Um, in my personal practice, I do see a lot of patients who are um, who fit the the demographic of patients who would do well uh, and who have done well in outpatient shoulder arthroplasty, um, and I think it's a good option to have, but. Again, with anything, uh, with any adoption of a new system, we need to be cautious. And then one other point, uh, you know, Dr. Sari was saying, um, you know, narcotics aren't bad, and certainly they're not bad. It also depends upon your location. In the United States, unfortunately, we have an opioid epidemic. A lot of patients expect to have no pain with any procedure, and you know, we know that that's impossible. Um, and so we need we need to balance that. Um, that's why it, you know we tend to use a lot of regional anesthetic, and we try to do as much as we can without opioids, at least in in the United States or in my particular practice. But you know, it's again, it's a balancing act, and you know, opioids certainly are are helpful. But we do uh, you know in the United States, we're faced with a, a set of challenges with regards to them. Yes. Uh, okay, so Thomas Farland, uh, one phrase from from the, your first slide was very uh, very to the point that if you lose a patient uh, due to the health patient, you will never forgive yourself. And I I uh, believe that we all agree to this. Uh, however, uh, the pathology of the patients, if apart from the from uh, a revision surgery. Uh, if he has an, uh, an arthropathy or an arthritis or a fracture, do you believe that play a, a role to select for uh, go on, uh, out, to, for doing outpatient surgery? If I understand your question, it's um, patients. Arthroplasty. We can do arthroplasty for fractures or for uh, arthritis or for right. uh, arthropathy. Do you right. believe that? This can be a, a, a reason that you can choose or avoid the outpatient uh, procedure. Well, yeah, I, you know, I think uh, patient selection is uh, really the critical issue. You know, unfortunately, you never know in advance who's going to have problems. Um, you know, I think, um, uh, and that's the that's the difficulty is that um, you know there there are sort of there are sort of algorithms, but um, you know. Uh, I think as uh, Peter said it right, you know, we all have different sort of patient populations. I think uh, I think there uh, should, and I probably didn't make as much of a distinction about in the States, you know, we have AS, these ASCs, these ambulatory centers that may or may not be attached to a hospital. And then there's doing patients in the hospital that are going to go outpatient. And so, um, you know, I was kind of reluctant even uh, back in the day to do uh, patients in our hospital as outpatients with this stuff now that's routine, like cuff repairs and stabilizations and fracture fixation. Uh, but I think arthroplasty is on a different plane than that. I think it's a, the patients are older. It's a bigger challenge to their systems. Um, and um, uh, they're, they have more comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, in fact, uh, I wouldn't uh, probably be so, um, I probably would, would agree with keeping them overnight, you know, because that's usually when you have the most problems. And I, I probably have some patients could, that I could do that with, but, um, but uh, everybody else, you know, I think they're just too fragile and too many things can happen and they need time to be educated on everything. And you have to have a really good system in place to do that. I mean, it's, I, I think a fracture, fractures, the trouble with fractures, you know, is they bleed a lot. And um, uh, when you're doing a, uh, pretty much I do reverses on most of the fractures that actually make their way to me. And, you know, those patients, they sometimes will drop their hemoglobin a lot and they'll, you know, get uh, symptomatic. So I would probably not do shoulder fractures, arthroplasties as an outpatient um, in any form or fashion. Uh, again, some cuff tear arthropathies and some arthritic patients are, they're as healthy as anybody. Uh, but, um, you know, they tend not to bleed very much. I don't think I've transfused a, one of those kind of patients in forever, uh, whereas the fractures occasionally do need to be transfused. Uh, so, yeah, again, I think it's still patient selection. Is that, is that what you're answering yes, the question? Yes, you answered my question. Dr. Venusis, uh, you said that, that you have uh, uh, 10% for your patients that uh, they leave the next, uh, the next morning. Uh, if I understand well. So, do you believe that it is worth to discuss about uh, this, uh, this thing, about uh, discharging the patients in the same day or a few, a few hours after, after the surgery? Which are the reasons? This is the COVID period, there are the economical reasons, there are other reasons that we should consider to, to, trans, to, 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 to change our uh, ex existing culture. Well, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that the decision is made the next morning. So it's up to how the patient feels. That's a critical factor. If the patient feels well and uh, the test, blood test and general condition is good and provided that they have the ability to readmit the patient anytime, any uh, day, I feel comfortable to leave him to go home, provided again that the home is somewhere in Attica, in the area, general area. I don't leave a patient to go to an island uh, after a total uh, uh, shoulder replacement, perhaps not for a week, I would say, or less uh, for, for a week. So uh, the decision is made on the day of the, uh, the next day of the, of the post-operative day, and provided the patient feel comfortable, well, and uh, he agrees. So that's something that I can do, that I don't do regularly, but I don't have any problem in let him go, provided all things that I said before. Okay, thank you. So we have a question for the audience. What is so, the, the uh, doctor, uh, yes. Manos. Uh, Ed wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, when I did my traveling fellowship through uh, Europe uh, back around 2000 or so, uh, some of the some of the countries people were keeping shoulder replacements like for 10 days, uh, and uh, it was sort of. I remember uh, it was particularly with Jill and those guys. You know, people were staying 10, 14 days, and I asked him why they do that, and he said, "Well, because the patients, if we send them home sooner, they get all upset." So, so I don't know, is, does anybody still do that in Europe? I mean, is that still a thing where people stay for a week or 10 days after? No, a no, no, no. Uh, the average uh, uh, stay in hospital in my department is about uh, the average, about two days, two post days. Yeah, mine as well. And as you said, as you said before, uh, the, the, the patient with, with fractures, uh, uh, is uh, less likely to be able to live in the second post operative They might need another day in order to uh, have a transfusion or stabilize their blood count and things like that. I think it is a monitoring uh, 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 may, concern. May, yeah. Sorry, yeah, may add something. 
And the pain management is something that needs to be clarified. I mean, I would never leave a patient with a block to leave the hospital the same day. Uh, we don't use as routine continuous blo uh, interscaline block. But again, uh, I would prefer to leave the, to 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 have the patient uh, to. I, I would prefer to have general anesthesia for the patient is about to leave in less than 24 hours. Yes. Uh, so, Peter. Yes. Can you define which is the, the, the candidate that we should consider uh, the, uh, as, a, as, as a proper candidate for uh, an outpatient surgery? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends upon uh, motivation, uh, social support, age, lack of comorbidities, uh, and desire. So, uh, you know, if, if the patient wants to go home the same day, if they have all of those issues in place, um, you know, I think that that's, that's the right patient. But yeah, certainly need to do very well vetting preoperatively on all of those fronts, age, um, medical comorbidities, preoperative hematocrit, um, make sure there's no, you know, cardiopulmonary uh, comorbidities that would uh, risk a, an adverse event. You have a, a, we have a question for you, Peter, from the audience uh, uh, concerning your paper in the Journal of Orthopedics. And, mm -hmm. uh, you had, you had, uh, you showed that you had the higher uh, rate of infection in outpatients arthroplasty than in patients. However, do you, do you have a selection criteria to avoid patients with higher likelihood of infection for out, outpatient arthroplasty? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that was a very small increase that was found in the, in the study that we performed. It was about 0.9% versus 0.65% in the two cohorts. Uh, and then other data has not borne that out. So it, it's hard to say if that is in fact the case other other studies have not sh have not confirmed that as far as selection criteria to avoid a uh, higher likelihood um certainly making sure that uh, you know we, i everyone has a different uh set of criteria or and and steps that they take to um decrease the risk of infection as much as possible for instance preoperative chlorhexidine uh, uh, preoperative uh, scrubs to decrease C acnes um, in terms of benzoyl peroxide, um, their antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, and also the comorbidities of patients. So I think that taking those all into account, in in addition to intraoperative considerations, uh, you know, changing use of gloves, iodine impregnated uh, drapes, I think those those are all important to decrease the risk of infection as much as possible. Irini, I don't know if you hear us. Do you believe that the OR time plays a role in the as a criteria for discharging the patient? Can you repeat the question? Yes. Do you believe that the OR time mm -hmm. is a factor plays his role for the patients to be discharged in the same day? Yes, of course, as in every surgery. Uh, if the surgery lasts uh, longer, it's going to be more difficult for the patient to recover from anesthesia. So we, we will have to, to keep him in the hospital. If the surgery lasts uh, less, it's going to be better for us. We're going to see a more clear view of the patient about six hours later. So we, we can have the decision uh, either to keep him or not. Okay. Dr. Rafalan, one, uh, uh, one, for, one uh, participant for the audience uh, says that there are cultural also uh, problems. He was in, in, uh, in, in Korea and uh, he says that uh, the patients want to stay for three to five days in South Korea and South Asia. And uh, what, what, 
what we can, how we can answer and make a cultural transition. So he also thinks in Asia are uh, uh, like that you described before. So uh, which is uh, your your beliefs about a person? Uh, apart from the economical reasons, you don't, you you want him. You how do you when do you feel uh, uh, safe to discharge him? What's your criteria? Who who was uh, it was Frusus? Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Oh, I think that was a question for you, Dr. McFarland. Oh, it was. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Well, I can no, also give. So when do you when do you feel safe to discharge your patients from hospital? Well, I have. Uh, I can answer. <laughs> I have three criteria. One is uh, they uh, can't have any drainage from their wound. Secondly, they have to be on oral pain medication. And the third, oddly enough, at our institution, who clears them to leave are the physical therapists because they make sure that they can get up and stand and walk around without passing out. And they show them how to use their brace and that kind of thing. So those are the those are the three criteria I use for somebody going home. OK. Does anyone uh, have to, to, to add something or we should close here? So this is the end of this mini battle. Thank you very much for attending. As uh, every Thursday, there is no battle. We all agree about the, 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 the main, the main uh, uh, guidelines, the main, where we have the same thoughts and the, 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 we confront the same problems. So the answer is pretty much the same all over the world. So thank you once again for being here with us. Dr. Mafala, Dr. Vezirides, Dr. Ferrusis, Dr. Sari. Uh, and uh, uh, the next uh, the next episode on November is dedicated to the Latter Z procedure. We hope to have you with us, and uh, we remind you that in order to earn some uh, CME points, you have to fill a teeny tiny questionnaire, which will be sent to you by email. You can also you can always follow our uh, course in the Facebook and then LinkedIn to stay in touch and follow we met because there are many interesting webinars in the uh, in the forthcoming period hosted by this platform thank you once again for attending thank you again for being with us thank you for the invitation. thank you thanks good everybody morning. thank you very much have a good day good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good day. bye bye <laughs>